Good morning, friends, and we'd like to welcome you to our study on the book of Daniel called Understanding Daniel. We are studying through Daniel chapter 11. We are going verse by verse through the whole book, and we're about two-thirds the way through uh, the first part of Daniel chapter 11. So we're going to continue that here in just a few moments. We want to welcome those who are joining us here, uh, those who are from the Granite Bay Church family. Very warm welcome to you. Also, our visitors who are joining us I'd like to welcome you to the Granite Bay Church and to our Sabbath school, to our study of the book of Daniel. Well, before we get to the lesson, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are so grateful for this opportunity to be able to gather together and open up your word and study a very detailed but interesting passage of scripture that helps prove that indeed, Lord, you know the end from the beginning. You can tell what is to happen in the future. You did through the angel Gabriel many years ago. And so thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as you mentioned a little earlier, we in Daniel chapter 11. uh, Chapter 11, because it's a very long chapter, is divided up into two parts. And we're about halfway through the first part. So if you have your notes, we're in Daniel chapter 11, part 1. And we're going to start our study today around verse 14. It's going to be the key passage that we're going to start with. Let me quickly just give you a background before we go to the notes, just so you know what's going on if you missed the first part of the chapter. So you'll find a series of kingdoms kind of repeated throughout the book of Daniel, starting in Daniel chapter 2. You've got the image of Nebuchadnezzar representing Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Western Europe, as we have it today, the feet of iron and clay, and then the second coming of Christ, the stone cut out without hands that strikes the image upon its feet. The same kingdoms are represented in Daniel chapter 7, but using different imagery. In Daniel 7, the kingdom of Babylon is represented by a lion with eagle's wings. You all remember this, right? This is just a review. The next kingdom to follow Babylon was Medo-Persia, and in Daniel chapter 7, it's represented as a bear raised up on its one side with three ribs in its mouth. You remember that? Then the next kingdom was Greece, and Greece was represented as a leopard with four wings, and the leopard had four heads representing the four divisions of the Grecian Empire after the death of Alexander the Great. And then there is sort of a nondescript beast that you find in in Daniel chapter 7. It has great iron teeth and it devours much flesh, and that represents the kingdom of Rome. But then Daniel in chapter 7 notices that there are ten horns on this beast representing Rome, and amongst the ten horns, a little horn grows up that uproots three other horns. Well, that's identified as the rise of the papal power. So you have pagan Rome up until the uh, legalization of Christianity in 313 AD. Then a few years later, you have the establishment of the papal power in 538. And that's the little horn power that you read about in Daniel chapter 7. And it brings you right up to a time of judgment where Daniel says, I saw the Ancient of Days. He was seated, speaking of God God the Father in heaven. The books were open, judgment was set, one likened to the Son of Man, Jesus, coming in before the Ancient of Days. And at the end of that, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and Jesus comes. So Daniel 7 traces the same history, starting with Babylon, using different imagery all the way to the second coming of Christ. The same thing is seen in Daniel chapter 8. The focus there, beginning not with the kingdom of Babylon, because Babylon was about to fall, but it starts with a ram with two horns, representing Medo-Persia, and then a uh, he-goat that has a notable horn between his eyes, representing Greece and Alexander the Great. And then the notable horn was broken, and four others grew up in its place, representing the four divisions of the Grecian Empire. And then it talks about another horn that would arise, that would persecute the people of God and also the Christians during the Christian era, and that's representing Rome first in its pagan form and then Rome in its papal form during the 1260 years of papal supremacy. Then in chapter 8, verse 14, the question is asked, how long shall these things continue? The answer comes back, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. We study this all in detail. That represents the beginning of the high priestly final phase of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, symbolized by the Day of Atonement. And that's where Jesus entered into his final judgment phase, which ends at the close of probation, And then the second coming of Christ. Did you follow that? All right, so that's the background. That's what we've seen in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8. Daniel chapter 11 takes us all the way back and goes through the same history but gives a lot more details. Very interesting. So it begins by describing Persia. And then it talks about Greece and how Greece was divided up 
into its four divisions, and then it focuses primarily on the king of the north and the king of the south during the time of the Grecian Empire. That is the Seleucid kingdom in the north and the Ptolemy or Ptolemy kingdom it's spelt with a P in the front, but I think the way you pronounce it is Ptolemy, depending where you're from. Some places it's Ptolemy or Ptolemy. But the two key kingdoms, and why are those two focused on? Because Israel was between the two. And whenever the king of the north would come down and conquer the king of the south, or do battle with the king of the south, or the king of the south would go up to do battle with the king of the north, it always involved Israel and the people of God. And so they kind of exchanged hands during this time period, all right? And that's where we find ourselves right now in verse 14. We're talking about the Seleucid Kingdom, the Ptolemy Kingdom. We're talking about this conflict back and forth. All right, starting in verse 14. Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 14. It says, Now in those times many shall rise up against the king of the south, meaning the Ptolemy Kingdom. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfilling the vision, but they shall fail. Now, when the angel Gabriel that is giving this prophecy to Daniel says, and violent men of your people shall exalt themselves, it's referring to some amongst the Jews. Something was to happen in Israel in relationship to this. So let, let's look at the history. At first, the Jews welcomed Syrian victory over Egypt, that's the king of the north, and the subjugation of the territory by Sir, to Syrian rule. But under Antiochus Epiphanes, Syrian rule became more oppressive than that of Egypt. Returning from Egypt in 168 BC, that's the time period we're looking at, Antiochus Epiphanes took Jerusalem with slaughter and devastation. He entered the temple, robbed and polluted it, he offered a pig on the altar, and installed a profane and wicked person in the high priestly office. A prominent Jewish family known as the Maccabees led a Jewish revolt against Syria, against the Syrian rule, and in 161 BC they sent ambassadors to Rome and they entered into a league of protection with the Romans. Kind of interesting here. You have the Jews entering into a league of protection with the Romans. Boy, did they live to regret that. You'll find out a little later in the story what Rome eventually did to the Jews. Okay, verse 15. Time period is around 160 BC, right in that time period. So the king of the north, that is the Seleucid kingdom, shall come and build a siege mount and take a fortified city. And the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. So having mentioned the Maccabean resistance, the prophecy now returns to the conflict between the Assyrian and the Egyptian kingdoms. Antiochus Epiphanes, king of the north, extended his military campaigns deep into Egypt. Faced with imminent danger, Egypt appealed to Rome for help. Now in the prophecy, we're beginning to hear more about Rome, and Rome is growing in its influence and in its power. The next part of that note says, before Rome came to the assistance of Egypt, Antiochus Epiphanes managed to conquer all of Egypt except for the city of Alexandria, which at the time was the capital of Egypt. As he was preparing to besiege Alexandria in 168 BC, Pompilius Leonus, representing the Roman Senate, confronted Antiochus with a stern ultimatum, ordering, ordering him to refrain from attacking, attacking Alexandria. So you've got Antiochus Epiphanes, right, about ready to conquer the capital of Egypt, Alexandria, and suddenly Rome intervenes and says, don't do it, okay? Antiochus answered that he would give his reply after consulting with his officers. This is happening just outside of Alexandria. Leonus took his staff and drew a circle in the sand around Antiochus and demanded that he provide an answer before leaving the circle. Have you heard the phrase, a line in the sand? That's where it comes from. After a few moments, Antiochus yielded to the ultimatum of Rome. This marked a change in the rulership of the Mediterranean kingdoms from Greeks to Romans. So now we see the elevation of the Romans and the decline of the Greeks and the line in the sand. Here's a painting that uh, was painted in 1779 by a French artist that's actually housed in a um, French museum of art. And there is the picture. You've got Antiochus Epiphanes standing in the circle and Leonis representing the uh, Roman Senate drawing a circle saying, give me your answer before you leave the Senate, uh, before you leave the circle. And of course, Antiochus Epiphanes did submit to Roman authority at this point. Okay, verse 16 goes on and says, but he who comes against him shall do according to his own will. 
and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land and destruction, uh, with destruction in his power. Now, when the prophecy refers to the glorious land, what is it referring to? Remember, our time period is around 160 A.D. What would be considered the glorious land at that time? Israel or Jerusalem, right? God's people. So after conquering Syria and making it a Roman province, the Roman general, Pompey, invaded Palestine, the glorious land, and Judea fell into Roman hands in 63 B.C., when Pompey took Jerusalem after a siege of three months. From this point forward in the prophecy Daniel 11, of Daniel 11, Rome is presented as the king of the north, first in its pagan phase, that's what we're looking at now, but later in its papal phase. So the king of the north represents several things. It begins by representing one of the divisions of the Grecian Empire, the uh, Syrians up north, and then it transitions into Rome and eventually into papal Rome. Why is Rome considered the king of the north? Well, because in the relationship to Israel, when the Romans would come up and down, they would come from the north, right? So that's why the king of the north represents different things. It represents the powers to the north of Israel. The king of the south would represent powers to the south of Israel. So keep that in mind. It's not always the same power. It's not the same king. It's not always the same nation. But it's the power dominating from the north of Israel and a power dominating from the south. That's the king of the north, king of the south, as we keep going. All right, verse 17. So now we're talking about Rome, pagan Rome. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and the upright ones with him, thus shall he do. Pause right there. Who do you think the upright ones are? Talking about 160, uh, even less, 100 AD, that time period, so it's before Christ. The upright ones would represent the Jews, right? The ones living in the glorious land, the Jews, Daniel's people. The next part of the verse, the middle of the verse, verse 17, it says, And he shall give him the daughter of woman to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be for him. We're getting a little intrigue going on here in the prophecy. We're going to see in just a minute. Having identified Rome as the king of the north in the previous verse, the current text shows that how, shows how Rome expanded its territory over the whole kingdom. The upright ones refer to an agreement between the Jews and the Romans in 161 BC, this League of Friendship, and the Jews formed a League of Friendship with Rome as recorded in the book of Maccabees. Now the book of Maccabees is not in the Bible, it's considered one of those apocryphal books, but it does have some interesting history. And you can read about the history that occurred there uh, amongst the, in the book of Maccabees. So following this agreement with Rome, the Jewish nation sought, uh, soon began to feel the oppressing power of the Roman yoke and longed for deliverance from its ruthless power, but it was too late. Who is the daughter of woman? The daughter of woman refers to Cleopatra. You probably heard about Cleopatra, the daughter of Ptolemy XI of Egypt. After Julius Caesar invaded Egypt in 48 BC, Cleopatra became his mistress until he was assassinated in Rome in 44 BC. She then turned her attention to Mark Antony, the rival to Octavia, Octavia, sorry, the rival to Octavian. There is another Octavia later, but Octavian, Octavian later became Augustus, a Julius Caesar's heir. Octavian, later Augustus, defeated the combined forces of Cleopatra and Antony at Actium in 31 BC, another important date. You'll see why in just a minute. The following year, Antony committed suicide, believed to be engineered by Cleopatra, and Cleopatra tried to win the affections of Octavian, but when this failed, she also committed suicide. All right, so that is the daughter of woman. A further comment on that. With the death of Cleopatra, the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt ended. And from, 30 BC, or fr and from 30 BC, Egypt became a province of the Roman Empire. Cleopatra's devious career well matches the description of the daughter of woman who would not stand with him or before him, but for her own political interests. We're going to learn more about Cleopatra later on as she comes up again in the prophecy. Well, here we have a decisive battle. This is the Battle of Actium. It took place in 31 uh, BC between the forces of Rome and the combined forces of Antony and Cleopatra. So uh, 
Anthony, Anthony divorced his wife, joined forces with Cleopatra, trying to uh, resist Augustus, who was coming down from Rome. There was this decisive battle that took place here at Actium. This is a painting that um, was actually done by, let's see, it was done by a French artist, Lorenzo Castro, in 1672. And it is in the, um, uh, sorry, a Flemish artist, and it's in the Museum of London if ever you wanted to go see it. But that's a description, a picture of this battle at Actium, a rather important battle, and you'll see why we have that specifically mentioned here in just a minute. All right, verse 18. It says, After this he shall turn his face to the coastlines and shall take many. Talking about Julius Caesar. But a ruler shall bring the approach against them to an end, and with the reproach removed he shall turn back on him. Now, I know that seems like a complicated sentence, so we'll break it up here. Julius Caesar is the one who says, after this he, that's Julius Caesar, was a gifted military leader. And after conquering Gaul, modern-day France, he extended his empire to the coasts of Africa, Asia Minor, and Europe. So rapid were his conquests that when responding or reporting his military progress back to Rome in 47 BC, he gave the famous dispatch, you've probably heard this before, I came, I saw, I conquered, right? It comes from Julius Caesar. All right, still talking about that verse. It says, after the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, the prophecy talks more about that later on as well, political chaos ensued in Rome with various factions vying for power. In 43 BC, the second triumphant, a group of three men who held power in ancient Rome, was formed, consisting of Mark Antony, the one we just read about with reference to Cleopatra, Octavian, later known as Augustus, and Lepidus. Now notice you got Augustus and you got Mark Antony and they went to battle in Actium. So we're going to find out how that happened. They determined to avenge Caesar's death. This is before the battle. Um, eradicated those involved in the conspiracy and bring the reproach against them to an end. And this they did. In October 42 BC, the forces of the Second Triumphant defeated the forces of the leading conspirac conspirators who had the assassination of Julius Caesar orchestrated, Brutus and Cassius at Philippi and Macedon. After their defeat, Brutus and Cassius committed suicide. Thus the reproach was removed and the way was opened up for Octavian or Augustus to become emperor of Rome. Okay, that's the historical context of the verse. Verse 19. Then he shall turn his face towards the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Now the he there in verse 19 is still Julius Caesar. It's going to explain what happened to him when he returned back to Rome after he gained all these victories. After Julius Caesar returned to Rome, the fortress of his own land, he was made dictator for life and became the absolute sovereign of the empire. But then at the height of his power and worldly glory, he was struck down by his own countrymen. Despite his military success and popularity amongst the people, Julius Caesar was assassinated on March the 15th, 44 BC in Rome. The assassination was the result of a conspiracy involving several Roman senators who were opposed to Caesar's increasing power and autocratic tendencies. So they mounted this attack. Look at the note. It says the assassination took place in the theater of Pompeii during a meeting of the Senate. The conspirators, led by Brutus and Cassius, approached Caesar under the pretext of discussing matters of state, and then they proceeded to stab him to death. The conspirators claimed that they were acting in defense of the Roman Republic. However, the assassination of Julius Caesar led to a series of civil wars and paved the way for the rise of Octavian, later known as Augustus, and the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the Roman Empire. So, rather interesting historical facts are taking place, highlighted here in the passage. Here is another painting. This one was done um, in 1865 by a German artist and is housed in one of the museums in Germany. And there you got a picture of Julius Caesar being attacked by Brutus and the other senators. And that brought an end to Brutus's reign, or rather, uh, Julius Caesar's reign. Verse 20, there shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed 
but not in anger or in battle. So what would happen after Julius Caesar was assassinated? Well, there were a series of civil wars. You have Mark Antony going down to Egypt, connecting with uh, Cleopatra. There is this big naval battle. Eventually, the forces of Antony fall to that of Julius, uh, Augustus, rather. But then Augustus does something rather interesting. It says he will impose taxes. After the death of Julius Caesar, 44 BC, Octavian, his adopted son, same name as Augustus, became the emperor. He changed his, changed his name to Augustus Caesar, and he named one of the months of the year after himself. That's where August comes from. During his reign, a new tax was imposed upon all the citizens of the empire. This new tax decree caused Mary and Joseph to journey to Nazareth, to Bethlehem of Judea, where Jesus was born. Isn't that interesting? So some 500 years before the event, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel that a king would arise that would impose taxes on the glorious land or on Israel. Of course, we know that refers to Augustus Caesar. Now, here's the quote from Luke, chap Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. There it is. That all the world should be registered or taxed. This census first took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David. So it's Augustus Caesar that passed a decree that led to Mary and Joseph traveling from Nazareth down to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Very interesting. Okay, verse 20, still talking about Augustus. The note there says, Augustus died not in anger or in battle, but peacefully in his bed, August 1980-14, at the age of 74. This was so unusual that a Roman emperor would die peaceably that the angel specifically noted it in the prophecy that says he will die not in anger or in battle. So that brings us to the end of Augustus, but also the birth of Jesus. Here we have a marble statue of what Augustus Caesar looked like. I noticed he's got big ears. I don't know why, I just that stood out. He's a young, handsome guy, but he had big ears. Probably wasn't as big as it looks in the, in the marble statue. They probably made him look even stronger than he was. But anyway, there's, there's what Augustus Caesar, the one who raised taxes, whose decree brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. Verse 21, it says, And in his place shall arise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. What happened after Augustus died? When Augustus, looking at the note, was about to nominate his successor to the throne, his wife, Livia, besought him to appoint Tiberius, her son, by a former husband. But Augustus refused, appointing Agrippa instead. But shortly after his nomination, Agrippa died, and again Augustus was required to choose another successor. Livia renewed her appeals for Tiberius, and Augustus, weakened by age and sickness, finally consented to designate Tiberius as his successor. Thus Tiberius became emperor by the flattery of his mother and came to power peaceably, seizing the kingdom by intrigue. So Augustus Caesar was the one at the time of the birth of Jesus. Tiberius Caesar was the one at the time of the death of Jesus. And that's even mentioned here in this prophecy. You'll see in just a minute. The rule of Tiberius was that, was that of a tyrant filled with ferocity and violence on the one hand, flattery and deception on the other. He was despised by his people, detested by the Senate. The angel's description of him being a vile person aptly illustrates Tiberius Caesar's character and conduct. Let's look at verse 22. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. Now, who's the prince of the covenant? It's referring to Jesus. After ascending to the position of emperor, Tiberius ruthlessly executed individuals he suspected of sedition or perceived to be a threat to his authority. Thousands became victims of the king's jealousy and suspicion. He was also successful in leading several military campaigns in Central Europe and on the eastern frontiers of his empire. Thus, with a flood, a force of a flood, 
He swept away those who opposed his will. The prince of the covenant is a reference to Jesus. We're going to look up some verses here in Dan in just a minute. According to Luke chapter 3, 1, 2, Jesus was baptized in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius and was crucified in 31 AD by the decree of Pontius Pilate, who owed his governorship of Judea to the favor of Tiberius, the uncle of his wife. Thus, the Prince of the Covenant was broken during the reign of Tiberius. Isn't that amazing? Not only did the angel predict the king, the emperor, who would be alive at the time of Christ's birth, a raiser of taxes, but it also says the next king would rise up against the Prince of the Covenant, that being Jesus. Well, let's take a look at a few of these verses in Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, talking about Jesus as the Prince of the Covenant. This, again, is the angel Gabriel, and he is talking to Daniel, and he's giving a very interesting time period. We call it the 490-year the prophecy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. This is Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. Daniel 9.26 says, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end shall be with a flood. Until the end, war and desolations are determined. So now the angel Gabriel, he's explaining to Daniel. He says, From the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which happened in 457 B.C., the decree of Artaxerxes, that allowed the Jews to go back and start the rebuilding not only of the temple, which for the most part was built, but the walls surrounding Jerusalem and the establishment of their own government uh, from that time period, 457 BC, until Messiah the Prince, that is the anointing of Jesus, that occurred in 27 AD, that was at the baptism of Christ, when Jesus came up out of the water, it says the heavens were opened, the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove, came to rest upon him, and of course, there was a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm all pleased. Jesus was anointed for his public ministry. Three and a half years later, in 31 AD, Jesus died on the cross. He brought an end to the sacrifices and offerings, the temple, the temple, the veil rent from top to bottom. And then for another three and a half years, the apostles almost exclusively, a few exceptions, but for the most part, um, proclaimed the gospel to the Jews until the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD. That brought an end to the 70 weeks or the 490 years of probationary time that God had given to the Jewish people. Now, this verse also talks about the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. That prince is not the prince of the covenant. That is another king, another ruler, and that is reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That is the judgment that came upon the Jews after their probation closed in 34 AD, God, in his mercy, extended that time of tranquility so the gospel could still be preached until 70 AD when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Yes, Christian. Yeah, Pastor, I'm, con I'm confused about who this prince is who will come. If it's not Jesus, who is it? It's Tiberius, and it refers to Titus. It's Titus and the Romans that came and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. But then Daniel goes on to say that this prince is going to be in the temple, and he's the, going to be the, the ab abomination of the abomination. No, yes. Yeah. No, it can so, be a little confusing in the way it's written there in Daniel. But Daniel is addressing two specific things. It's referring to Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus, and then it's talking to what's going to happen to Jerusalem. Because the answer comes, or at least Daniel's praying, and the answer to Daniel's prayer, the angel Gabriel says, now I've come to give you understanding. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, that's the Jews, and upon the holy city, that's Jerusalem. So the subject that's addressed is not only Messiah the prince, but it's also the city of Jerusalem. What's going to happen to Jerusalem? And so the prince of the covenant is Jesus. He confirms the covenant for seven years or, you know, seven days. In the midst of that, he brings an end to the sacrifice and offerings. That's in 31 AD. Jesus dies on the cross. And then probation closes in 34. But the prince of the people who is to come, that's not Jesus. That's not the followers of Jesus. That is the Romans, Titus, the people of the prince, the Romans will come and destroy the temple and Jerusalem. Christians were never involved in destroying Jerusalem or the temple. Okay, so we're not talking about the same group. There are two 
different topics being addressed there in chapter 9. All right. Yeah, I have a follow-up on that. I have a, do have a follow-up. In, in Matthew 24, uh, Jesus describes this entity in the, in the holy place from Daniel 9 as being the abomination of desolation. So, according to your narrative, then Jesus is calling himself the abomination yes. of desolation. Yes, no, no, Jesus is never calling himself the abomination of desolation, but in Matthew 24, where Jesus says to his disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, whosoever reads, let him understand, this is Matthew 24, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, when Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, incidentally, who's the abomination of desolation? It's Rome under Titus. When you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, we are not talking about the holy place inside the sanctuary. Remember, the city of Jerusalem was considered the holy city, and surrounding the walls of Jerusalem, there was a portion of land, you can read about this in Josephus, Jewish historian, that was considered holy land. Jesus said these words to his disciples while he was on the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem was spread out before him. And he said to his disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. They knew exactly what he was saying. How do we know that they understood what Jesus was saying? Well, because Luke translates the same thing and says, when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, then know that a desolation is near. Then let him that be in the mountains or be in Jerusalem flee into the mountains. Don't come back and get anything. So it is clear in the mind of the disciples that the holy place was not the sanctuary. The holy place referred to by Jesus was this area surrounding Jerusalem, and the abomination was the Roman armies under Titus. So you've got to kind of put the pieces together here, all right? So the prince of the covenant clearly is Jesus. The people of the prince that should come refers to Titus and the Romans in 70 AD. All right, Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. One more verse talking about this. It says, through his cunning, he shall cause the sea to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart, and he shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of the princes, but he shall be broken without human means. Now, the he in Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, refers to papal Rome later on. So you have pagan Rome rising up against the prince of the covenant, but you have papal Rome rising up against the prince of the covenant, meaning the papal power would try to usurp the position of Jesus by introducing a counterfeit form of salvation, a counterfeit service, a counterfeit sanctuary service, directing people's attention away from what Jesus is doing in heaven to what the leadership of the church is doing in Rome. So it's a counterfeit system. We actually will go into that in a lot more detail in the second half of Daniel chapter 11. Okay, let me finish up. Did we finish the note there? We did, didn't we? Let me read it again just to make sure we're on the same page. This is the note under verse 22. The Prince of the Covenant is a reference to Jesus, as we mentioned. According to Luke 3, 1 to 2, Jesus was baptized, I think we did read this, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius and was crucified in 31 AD by decree of Pontius Pilate, who owed his governorship of Judah to the favors of Tiberius, the uncle of his wife. Thus, the Prince of the Covenant was broken during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Okay, during the latter part of his reign, still reading on, Tiberius withdrew to the island of Capri, leaving much of the governance to his subordinates. He died in 37 AD, and his death was attributed to natural causes. However, some historians account, or some historical accounts suggest that he may have been smothered under the orders of Calig uh, Caligula, his successor. So there's all kinds of plots and counterplots that took place during that time. Verse 23, so we're up now to the time of the crucifixion of Jesus, all right? Verse 23, and after league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and be strong with a small number of people. Now, let me just give you a little context before we read this. So thus far, the vision has come all the way up to the Prince of the Covenant. He'll rise up against him. He's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, in the prophecy, a step, uh, the, the angel steps back, so to speak, to give you a broader context as to how Rome arose and what Rome did. So it kind of backs up a little bit gives us further information about when pagan Rome was established, and it also talks about how pagan Rome will end. So that's what's going to be happening in the next few verses. So it says, And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully. Rome began as a city-state, and the Romans were only a small people. Yet through its craft, organization, wise rulership, and ability to form leagues with various nations, they became strong and ruled the whole world. 
as the verse states, he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. The league reference in this verse has been identified as Rome's policy of arranging treaties or mutual assistant pacts which claim to protect and promote mutual interests between Rome and various nations that submitted to authority. In reality, Rome worked deceitfully by imposing high taxes on her allies and kept the spoils of conquest for herself. Eventually, these allies lost all independence and they were absorbed into the Roman Empire. So that's describing how Rome came to power. It was a little different than the other kingdoms. You'll see in just a minute. Verse 24. He shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse amongst them the plunder, the spoil, and the riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a... Time. That's important, but only for a time. Rome secured control of the world's wealthiest regions by leagues of friendship and political alliances. This was especially true in the case of Egypt, as well uh, as this uh, region contained vast amounts of wealth. Rome also used its Jewish alliance to further its interest in the eastern Mediterranean, growing ever stronger and eventually assuming control of the richest places of the province. This form of territory expansion through leagues and alliances was new to the Mediterranean world. As up to this point, empire building was done using military force. Now, make no mistake, Rome had a very powerful military, but for the most part, their military wasn't used to expand their territory, at least not at first. It was to control their territory. Now, there were some in the northern regions of the Roman Empire and later on all the way over into, into um, England, to Britain, you have the Roman expansion. But primarily, Rome expanded using leagues and treaties and forming alliances, especially in the early days as rose Rome to power. Okay, now what about a time? This is so interesting. A time in Bible prophecy symbolizes a year. So it says, she shall rule, speaking of Rome, for a time. So a time represents a year. A biblical year contains 360 days, and one prophetic day represents one literal year. We know that. We've looked at other verses talking about this. Thus, according to the verse, the supremacy of pagan Rome would last 360 years. It is significant to note that from the Battle of Actium, remember that battle between uh, Antony, Cleopatra, and Augustus, which really opened up the way for Augustus to become supreme ruler in Rome. From that battle in 31 BC, when Augustus became the first Roman emperor, with supreme power to the removal of the capital from Rome to Constantinople by Constantine in 300, uh, in, so it should be BC, sorry, 80, that's correct, 8303, was precisely 360 years or one prophetic time. Now, you might be looking at that, and you do the math, 31 B.C. to 331. Uh, that doesn't seem exactly right. That's 361. But remember, when you go from B.C. to 80, there is no zero year. So it works out exact to 360 days. All right, remember, there's no year zero when going from B.C. to 80. When Constantine died in 337, the empire was divided into three divisions and never again united. So how long would pagan Rome rule? For 360 years. And history proves that true. Amazing. Written some 500 years. More than that. 800 years. 900 years before the actual events took place. The angel Gabriel spelled out exactly how long pagan Rome would rule. Just amazing. Verse 25. It says, And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand for they shall devise plans against him. The angel now goes back to the beginning of this time period, this 360 years of pagan Rome supremacy, and summarizes some key conflicts between Rome, king of the north, and Egypt, king of the south. The 360 years of pagan Rome supremacy began when Augustus, by the authority of the Senate, declared war on Egypt to punish Mark Antony, who had been sent to Egypt on government business but fell victim to the charms of Cleopatra. She convinced him to reject his wife, Octavia, and to unite his interests with Egypt instead of Rome. So that's how uh, Antony made it there. Mark Antony and Cleopatra assembled a large army with many ships 
for an impending battle with Rome. On September the 2nd, 31 BC, at the mouth of the Gulf of Ambrisia, near the city of Actium, the Roman and the Egyptian navies engaged in battle, with the Egyptians suffering a devastating defeat. This was the beginning of the end for Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Verse 26 says, Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him, his army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. He's talking about uh, what's going to happen to Mark Antony as it relates to Augustus. It says there, the note, in the following battles between Rome and Egypt, many of Antony's soldiers deserted him and joined forces with Augustus, who received them with open arms. When Antony arrived in Libya, he found that the troops that he had left there had declared for Augustus, and in Egypt, his forces had surrendered to the Roman army. In outrage and despair, Antony committed suicide, and Cleopatra, failing to win the affections of Augustus, caused herself to be fatally bitten by a poisonous snake. Resistance to the Roman rule was broken, and Egypt became a Roman province. Thus, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies had their armies swept away, and many were killed. All right? Next part of that, still talking about Mark Antony and Augustus. The relationship between Mark Antony and Augustus was initially one of political collaboration and friendship, as seen in the formation of the Second Triumphant, Mark Antony, Octavian, Augustus, and Marcus Lepidus in 43 BC. However, personal and political differences, particularly Antony's involvement with Cleopatra and the ensuing power struggle, led to a bitter rivalry and war. The defeat of, of Antony and Cleopatra marked a turning point in Roman history, leading to the establishment of the Roman Empire under Augustus and the start of the 360-year rule of pagan Rome. You all hanging in there okay? A lot of history, isn't it? I hope you like history. I do. Verse 27. We're almost done. Hang in there. Both the king's hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table. But it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. I'll read about that. Antony and Augustus were formerly allies. Octavia... Antony's wife was Augustus' sister. Now remember, Octavian was Augustus' name before he changed it to Augustus. So you have Octavian, and Octavian had a sister called Octavia. Octavia, believe it or not, was the wife of Antony. You get the family intrigue involved there, <laughs> the political alliances. All right, so that's what's happening at the time. Yet under the garb of friendship, they were both speaking lies and aspiring for universal dominion. They professed friendship, but they professed friendship, but they planned for war. The alliance sealed by Antony's marriage to Augustus' the sister did not prosper. The uh, dominance of Rome in its pagan form continued for one prophetic time, or exactly 360 literal years. The capital of the Roman Empire, as we've mentioned, was officially moved from Rome to Constantinople in 330 AD by the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. He dedicated the new capital, Byzantine. Byzantium, I should say, which he had exclusively renovated and expanded and renamed it Constantinople, uh, the modern-day Istanbul in Turkey. Thus, at the appointed time, the events took place that opened the way for the establishment of the papal power in the city of Rome as both a religious and a civil power. And now things are going to shift as we get later on into the chapter 11. The focus now shifts from pagan Rome to papal Rome. Last verse for this morning. Verse 28, while he returned to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. Christ is identified in scripture as the prince of the covenant, Daniel eleven twenty two, and it is Jesus who was to confirm the covenant for many with one week, for one week, as we read in Daniel nine twenty seven. This covenant represents the plan of salvation established from the beginning and ratified through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. Consequently, the power mentioned here is at odds with the divine plan of salvation and is seeking to undermine and prevent the proclamation of the gospel. This has been identified, if you look at the note, scholars have applied this prophecy to Rome's persecution of the Christians. Of course, Christianity was not legalized in the Roman Empire until 313. Prior to that, there was severe persecution that came upon the early Christians. 
For 250 years, Christians faced intense persecution from pagan Rome. Some were covered with pitch and set on fire to serve as human torches to eliminate the arenas where thousands of Romans gathered to watch Christians being torn apart by wild animals. Nevertheless, the more the Christians were killed, the more they grew. And the devil had to change his tactic. Persecution was not getting rid of the church. He decided to provide infiltration. That, con that continued for a number of years, for hundreds of years, about 200 years in particular, where there was severe persecution. The worst of it was under Emperor Diocletian for about 10 years. Uh, that ended in 313. So you go back 303 to 313, 10 years of extreme persecution under Diocletian. He died, and then, of course, you have Constantine who legalizes Christianity. And there we have a little picture of some of the Christians. And yet there was such... I've read some of the experiences. If you want to read a little bit about this, you can read Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a classic, and it describes how that the early Christians stood even in the face of persecution from the Roman emperors and how they were such a powerful witness and uh, just powerful, powerful stories, how God protected, but in many cases allowed them to lay down their lives as a testimony of their faith. All right, last one that we have here. Although thousands of Christians were in prison and put to death, others were springing up to supply their places. Satan was losing his influence over the minds of the people and determined to fight more effectively against the gospel by introducing the false doctrines of pagan traditions into the church. This eventually led to the legalization of Christianity and paved the way for the establishment of papal Rome. And that's where we are in our study. So we're about halfway through chapter 11. The first half talks about Greece, a little bit about Persia, but mainly Greece and pagan Rome. And now from verse 29 onwards, we are shifting focus to papal Rome. And then just to give you a little hint, in verse 40 of Revelation, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 11, you have the time of the end. It brings us right up to our time. So there's a lot of interesting stuff still coming in chapter 11. Let's do the quiz here in the last two minutes, all right? Question number one, why did King Darius receive a visit from the angel Gabriel? Was it the king had been praying for a visit from an angel to strengthen the king's support of the Jewish Jews in Jerusalem or to warn him about future conflicts? Was it A, B, or C? It's B. You got to think back. It was B, right? King is Darius there. Verse two, in which book of the Bible is Xerxes referred to as Azuerus? Is it the book of Nehemiah, Esther, or Ezra? A, B, or C? It is Esther, right? The answer there is B. Very good. Number three. Which king did Alexander the Great defeat at the Battle of Arbella? 331 BC is when the battle took place. Was it Philip of Macedon, Marcus of Tyre, or Darius III of Persia? A, B, or C? C, all right? It was the Persian. Darius III of Persia is the answer. Number four. What did Antiochus II do as part of a peace agreement between the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic kingdom? He had his daughter marry the king of Egypt. He gave part of his territory to Egypt. He divorced his wife Laodice and married Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy II. Now you've got to go back to the first part of the chapter. The answer there is C, okay? We spoke about Laodice and Berenice earlier. Verse, uh, question number five. What phrase did Julius Caesar use to describe his military conquests in 47 BC? Did he say, the die is cast, divide and conquer, or I came, I saw, I conquered? See, all right. Verse 6, uh, question 6. What events followed the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC? The immediate peace and stability of Rome, the expansion of Roman territories, or political chaos and civil war? A, B, or C? The answer is C. Number 7. Who became ruler of the Roman Empire after the death of Julius Caesar? Was it Mark Antony, Brutus, or Octavian, otherwise known as Augustus? A, B, or C? The answer is Augustus. All right. Question number eight. What did Augustus impose upon the citizens of the Roman Empire? Was it a new tax, a ban on all foreign religions, or mandatory participation in the Roman army? A, B, or C? The answer is A. And incidentally, that tax... That tax brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. All right, question number nine. What significant prophecy met its fulfillment during the reign of Augustus? The fall of Jerusalem, the legalization of Christianity, or the birth of Jesus? We just told you that, right? Answer C, the birth of Jesus. 
Question number 10. How did Tiberius come to power as emperor in pagan Rome? Through military conquest, through a public election, or by intrigue and flattery, A, B, or C? The answer is C, by intrigue and flattery. Question number 11. Who is the prince of the covenant of Daniel 11.22? Is it John the Baptist, King David, or Jesus? The answer is Jesus. Question number 12. What significant prophecy was fulfilled during the reign of Tiberius Caesar? Was it the establishment of a single Roman currency, the crucifixion of Jesus, or the Roman conquests of India? A, B, or C? The most important there is, of course, B, the crucifixion of Jesus. Number 13. How was the 360 years of pagan Rome supremacy symbolized in the prophecy? Was it symbolized by one prophetic time? Was it symbolized by the fall of Babylon? Was it symbolized by an eagle on the flag of Rome? A, B, or C? One prophetic day. Question number 14. I think this is our last question, right? What event marked the end of pagan Rome supremacy in AD 330? Was it the death of Nero? the assassination of Tiberius, or the removal of the capital from Rome to Constantinople? The answer is C. Whew, good job. All right, we made it through our first half of Daniel chapter 11. Next week, we're going to focus on the second portion, starting verse 29, the focus of which is on the rise of the papacy and what the papacy would do for the 1260 years of papal supremacy. So a very interesting study next week. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are grateful for your word. And even though there's a lot of details in history there, we're amazed, Father, how that these prophecies have been so accurately fulfilled. It encourages us to know that the Bible is not like any other book. It is an inspired book. It is your word, Lord. So thank you for this and pray that you continue to guide us as we study for a deeper and fuller understanding of these prophecies. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we want to thank you for joining us here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. We're going to take a short break while we get things set up. And so welcome. Thank you for being here.